Titus chapter 1. God is faithful. He's called you with a holy call. Titus chapter 1. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for the power from on high. The power to be a witness. To declare to others that you have risen. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for working mightily your plans and purposes. Thank you, Lord, as we trust in your purposes, your plan for each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Titus chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is what? After godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. But hath in these due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Isn't it amazing how it's the preaching of the word, and not only the one time preaching that you heard the good word of the gospel, but you keep hearing, and you come to church, and you have your devotional time, and you keep hearing that good word of God. And God keeps ministering to your heart. As you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, a new birth has taken place. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away. The new has come. All things are of God. There's a reconciliation that came forth through the blood of the Son when Jesus on the cross said, It is what? Finished. Amen. So now you and I can come into that presence of the Lord and enjoy His plan and purposes for our lives. And because of that, you've been predestinated into a calling which God called you before the foundation of the world to be conformed into the image of His Son. And in that, there's a purpose and a plan in your life that He is working out every single day. Praise God. So it says, the promise of eternal life, which God promised what? Before the world began. Amen? Before the world began, before there was planets, before there was anything, you know, God hung this world on nothing, didn't he? Pretty, pretty amazing God. He just hung it on nothing. He hung all the galaxies and all that we see. But before all that, God knew you. God knew you, and he called your name out. One day, there would be a birth, and you would be born. And one day, you would grow and hear the good news of the gospel. One day you would hear and know what the blood of Jesus has done for you. And that you would be redeemed out of the hand of the devil through the word and the promises. And by believing a new birth would happen because of what happened in the garden in the fall. When all sin passed <coughs> upon Adam and upon all men, Jesus came as the Savior to redeem us out of the hand of the wicked one. And he's now given us an understanding that we might know him that's true. That we might know Him and that life that He has for us. He's given us an understanding to know Him. This is the eternal life, eternal God. To know Him as Father through His Son, Jesus. And so all this was giving us the eternal life that was promised before time began. So that now, through the blood, we, we can be born again and enter into what God has for each one of us. Now I want you to go over to, or back to the book, Timothy. Chapter 1. And let's read verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting out of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Power and love and a sound mind. That's what God gave you. So that's a great victory verse, everybody. Power, love, and a sound mind. Not fear, not worry. God has given us a, not, a, not a spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Why? Because you are in God's hands and God's purposes are being fulfilled in your life. Now look what he says. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. That means a prisoner of hope, everybody. Amen? That's a good prisoner. It's a prisoner of hope, as it says in Zechariah. You've been delivered out of the pit where there's no water, and you're a prisoner of hope. That means you're in a living hope. Peter said because of the resurrection of Jesus, it's a living hope. It says, <clears throat> but thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, but be thou partaker 
of the afflictions. And yes, there's going to be persecutions. There's going to be things. Jesus said, the world hates me. And the world's going to hate you. It says, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us. Now remember this, very important. He saves you because he has a purpose for your life. God saves you. He doesn't sit around and say, hmm, what am I going to do with you now? He saves you because he has a purpose. Amen? He saved you, and it says here, and called you with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Do you notice it's his purpose and grace because the, 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 what God has for you can only be done in grace. Guess what? That's why we need God. Even as Mary, when the angel came and said, you shall conceive in your womb, and you shall call his name Jesus. She said, how? I know not a man. The angel said, the Holy Ghost shall overshadow you. And she said, be it unto me according to thy word. What was it? It was bigger than she was. The things that God's wanting to do with grace in your life are bigger than you are. And guess what it's going to take to accomplish what he wants you to do in grace? It's going to take the promises of God, which are bigger than you are. So in order for you to fulfill the destiny God has, you have to be living in his promises and in his grace. You want to be conquered by God? I should say, we all need to be conquered by God. And God wants to conquer us. Just like Jacob. He wrestled with that angel. His name was changed from Israel to a prince with God, from Jacob to Israel, <coughs> which means a prince with God. Now what I want you to see is when you're conquered by God, then you have a revelation and an understanding to live by faith in the promises of God. Why? Because you know it's by grace that you're saved. You know that you're putting your faith in God. You know that no man can boast because now it's all of God who is now working in your life a mighty plan, both to will and to do his good pleasure. In the word of God, everybody, just as it says in Jesus, and I, in, in Psalm 40 and uh, Hebrews 10, uh, it's all kind of connected, these Psalms, the Psalm there and Isaiah 10, but it says in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O God, thy law is within my heart. It was written in the volume of the book, the promises for Jesus. He would open the word. Remember, he wrote open to Isaiah 61. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He said that in, in Luke 4 and Matthew 4. He opened it. That was from quoting from Isaiah. He read, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. There were many times he would say that the scripture might be fulfilled. And then he'd say the scripture must be fulfilled. Things would happen and he'd say that the scripture would be fulfilled. Why? Because it was written in the volume of the book. It was written, the very destiny of Jesus. And believe it or not, it's in every book. The story of Jesus, you can find in each book as is, is Jesus is, is talked about. In some way or another, you see what God's wanting to do and His purposes in each book of the Bible. So just, just as much as it was written in the volume of the book for Jesus, guess what? It's written in the volume of the book for you. Because it's by grace and in promises. So as you press on with God and you learn and you grow and you're growing in your sonship. You're growing in who you are in Christ. You're growing in the promises. You're growing and you're getting stronger. As it says in 1 John, you're strong because the word of God abides in you. And you need, and the word of God abides in you. Or go, uh, and you need not teach. Well, i got two verses going here. One is the anointing teaches you all things. And the other one is in... 1 John chapter 2, that you are strong because the word of God abides in you. See, as that word abides in you, then you are strong. And as that word's in you and you're strong, that anointing is on you to help teach you about all things. Amen? Why? Because God's in your life now. You're looking at life differently. He's showing you how to speak. He's showing you how to communicate. He's showing you how to walk. He's showing you how to live. He's showing you how to get along with people. He's showing you how to forgive. He's showing you how to walk in a friendship and a fellowship with God. What is he doing? He's teaching you. Why? Because man has fallen. 
He has to be taught how to live for God. Guess what? You ever, anybody in here ever had to be taught how to sin? Probably not. That probably came pretty easy. But guess what? you got to be taught how to live for God. And that means we exercise ourselves in the godliness. We exercise ourselves in the right thing. And we got to press on. we got to hear. we got to listen. And we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can grow in our inheritance. We can grow in what God has for us. So it says here, who has saved us and called us with what kind of calling, everybody? It's a holy calling. That means it's God's presence and His grace that's going to work in your life in order to do this. Because it's far above. It's above your thinking. Remember it said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Because God is a spiritual mind, the mind of Christ. We are carnally minded without God. And the carnal mind and the spiritual mind, there absolutely is no communication. It says that in Romans 8. The carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. The carnal mind cannot please God. Why? Because it's not hearing and growing and learning from the Spirit of God. So it's in its own world, which is what Adam is in. Adam is in. Adam is in sin and death. Jesus came to break the power of sin and death off our lives so you and I could live in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And yes, it is a warfare. Yes, we're growing in grace. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ has freed you from the law of sin and death. That's Romans 8, 2. So it's a holy calling that God's life is coming into us and what he's doing is the verse I was, I was quoting was in Isaiah 55. His thoughts and his ways are higher than ours. But it says, as the rain comes down from heaven, so does my word come down. Well, what's God's word coming down for? Well, the word came in Jesus, but he died, rose again, to have a many-membered body of those that would be hearing through the word of God so that we could grow up and hear and listen and apply our hearts to knowledge, apply our hearts to wisdom, allow growth to happen, experience as you run up against the wiles of the enemy, you run up against things, the enemy's attacking, and you keep trusting God, you keep looking to God, you keep taking the truth that you learned, you keep speaking that word, and as you do, you're seeing the victory that comes through knowing Jesus. So what is he doing? He's saying, I'm going to take my thoughts. Through the word now, I'm going to give you my thoughts. Amen? Because the words are thoughts. Amen? God speaks the word. You speak. Amen? When you speak, that's your thoughts. Amen? That's your words. Jesus said, my words are spirit. And what else did he say? They're life. Praise God. How would you like every place you go, your words are spirit and life. Everywhere you go, you're life in people with words that are spirit and life. They're coming up out of your heart and they're life. And you're life in people. And they're hearing. And they're responding. And guess what? They're growing closer to God with the words of life. So it says, not according, it says, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Christ Jesus before the world began. Wow. What a plan. What an exciting to understand, everybody, that on this planet, and probably the only planet, <laughs> this word has been given to you and I to grow in Christ Jesus, the very words of God, that we can grow up and be God's sons and daughters. Amen? Given to us to grow. Look what it says here. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Through, through, the, through the gospel. So through the gospel, which is the good news that Jesus died, it's the good news that God says, I'm going to govern you. It's the good news that says you're a new creation. It's the good news that says God loves you. Out of that, God has brought immortality. That means he's brought life to you, so that he who has the Son has life. 
And out of that life, Jesus said, I've come to give you life more abundantly. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. But Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly so that you can live in that Zoe life of God. That's God's promises and his life for us and partaking of what he has for us. Very important. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, which will be back some. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say what? Rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious. Be careful. Don't worry. Be careful for nothing. It's amazing everybody. God is saying be anxious for nothing. Don't worry. But what is he saying? But in everything. Everything. Everybody say that. Everything. everything. By prayer and supplication. That means everything. You know what? When you pray and you make your request, you know what you're saying to God? I don't know everything. I don't know everything. But you do. And guess what? I'm in your plan. I'm in your purposes. I'm pressing on. I can't see, but you can, and you can enlighten my eyes, and you can help me along this path, and you've told me to not worry, because worry means I'm going to separate myself, and I'm going to think about it, and I'm going to allow myself to come up with the answer. And guess what? Sometimes it's the, some of the things are so big that they tend to swallow us up in what? Worry. Things come. We hear things. And what happens? Worry. You know what worry is? That sinking feeling inside your belly. Something happens, that sinking feeling. Like Peter was walking on the water and he got that sinking feeling. And what did he do? He began to sink. When Jesus said, come to me, Peter, come. He got that sinking feeling. He looked at the waves. He began to sink. What did Jesus say? Why did you doubt, Peter? Why? Because there was a plan. There was a purpose. And everybody, there's nothing greater than for you to be encouraged in the everlasting covenant because God wants you to trust Him. He wants you to trust Him that in the plan and the purpose and all that He has for your life, you can trust Him. And that's why He's given you an everlasting covenant through the blood of the Son. And if you really believe it, when you run up against something, even if you don't necessarily run up against it, He said in everything. Amen? In everything. What does he say to do? He says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be what? Everybody say it. Known. Do you think God knows them? I would say he does. But isn't it interesting that he wants you to say it? He wants you to make it known? He said he wants your own heart to say it. He wants you to really say, Father, huh, I don't know everything. I'm not such a hot shot. You know? Pride says, I know it. I can, I can do it. Adam says, I don't need God. I can do it myself. You know? And what happens? You worry and worry and all of a sudden you start fretting. And what do you do? You start taking pills. You start eating too much. You start drinking things you shouldn't drink. You start doing things you shouldn't do. Why? Because the worry overpowers you. And so somehow you've got to find relief. How do you spell relief? Relief. J-E-S-U-S. -S. Amen? And so Adam's way is we start finding ways in our flesh God's way is we trust, we commit, we speak, we bring our petitions to God saying, I don't have all the answers, but you do. 
And guess what, Father? I've got confidence in your purposes in my life. I've got confidence in your plan for my life. I've got confidence, Lord, that you're working in me. Now, everybody, I want to tell you this. What I'm telling you operates as you give your life to God. Amen? As you give your life to God, then this is a natural outflow of what God is saying to do. Pete, uh, Paul, in Philippians, you don't have to turn to it, but it's probably just back a page, 3.3 3 says, We are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and we have no confidence in the flesh. Amen? No confidence in the flesh. That means we are trusting the Holy Spirit. We're trusting the Holy Spirit that He's got the plan. We're trusting that He's leading and guiding. And did Paul go get into some trouble? Yes, he did. Did Paul have shipwreck? Yes, he did. There was one time the angel spoke to him and said that there will be no loss of life as long as they stay with you, Paul, and they're, they're, at, they're in the ship, staying together. Paul said there will be no loss of life. Things happened. You know, the Apostle Paul also said in verse Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, verses, um, Paul said he learned to be content. What was his secret of contentment? What was this great secret that Paul said, I learned to be content? He learned to trust God. He learned in the confidence that he put in God's purposes. That he would rest in God. Even when he was in the, in, in, the, <coughs> me, in the prison. What did he do? He and Silas, they began to sing praises. In the darkest prison. He began to sing praises. And there was an earthquake. And things began to happen. And they were loosed. Why? Because they began to put action and faith into God's purposes and plans. That in praise and worship... God was going to do some mighty things to release the captives. So what does he say again? Be careful. Don't worry. Worry and fretting and all that means I am trying to do it myself. And in it, we start finding escapes. When God says, this is the opportunity that I want you to hold on to me with prayer and supplication. Finding those verses, finding that word, finding those promises, finding those things that are going to give you a breakthrough to the other side. Amen? Prayer and supplication. It says with what? Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you are leading and guiding. Thank you, Lord, that your purposes and your plans are being worked out in my life. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to bring me through to the other side. Thank you, Lord. It says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Be careful for nothing but in everything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You see, it's an act of worship, everyone. And what is that worship saying? I have faith in your plan, Father. I got confidence in you. And as I continue to thank you and I praise you, look what it says. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, through Christ Jesus. He's saying there, if you are in that place to want to worry, he said, if you will turn over to God and you will pray, and you will let your request be made known, it says, then, if you do your part at the altar, and you do your part as an act of worship before God, God said that there would be a peace that would come into you, and what would it do? It would guard your what? Heart and mind. It would keep you, it would guard it. It means God was literally going to guard your heart, your spirit, your heart. And what? Your mind. Remember that song we sang? My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Everyone, God is literally saying to you and I, instead of worry, we begin 
to petition God. We begin to bring our requests. It says, make it known. If you are fretting and worrying, and you have not made your request be made known, your request has not been made known unto God, then guess what? This other part isn't going to happen in your life. What is it? What's the other part? The peace God has for you will not be there until you do the first part. Amen? Because it's you bringing your request. So what it says in what? Everything. You might say, what that's so small? Hey, you're saying to God, Father, I want you in every place in my life. No doors closed. Revelation 3.20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He was saying that to the church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open the door and let me in, I'll come and sup with them. We'll have fellowship together. He said, I'm standing at the door and knocking. That's what he's doing. He said, I want to come in. I want to bring that peace. I want to bring myself to you. If any man will open the door, I will come and sup with him and he with me. There will be a fellowship going on within. That's the delight of the Lord. In fact, in Proverbs 8, speaking about wisdom, about the eternal son, it says, I was daily his delight, delighting with him before the world was. So he says, be careful for nothing but by everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will what? Keep your hearts and minds through what? Minds through Christ Jesus. That's his, who he is now as mediator of the covenant. That's who he is now as a great high priest. That's who he is now working in our hearts mightily. The book of Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. Jesus continued to cast his care. It says over in Peter, it says that he continued to turn everything over to his father who judged righteously. He continued to do this. And now he's telling us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is how he was operating and, and growing in his father. He turned it over to his father to, uh, who judged righteously. And now he's telling us to continue. And Peter said, cast all your care upon him. Because what? He cares for you. That means God is saying, don't carry the worry. Don't carry the fear. God has not given you a spirit of fear. But what? Power, love, and a sound mind. So we have to learn. And folks, this is a learning experience. This is learning by truth. That when your heart is full of care and worry, then we say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Lord said in His Word, be careful for nothing. I am going to make my request known. I am going to pray. I am going to cast my care. I am going to bring my supplications to the Lord. I am going to bring those promises. And I thank you, Lord, that you are going to bring that peace to my heart. To guard my heart and mind. Against what? Against the devil, against the spirit of fear, against fretting, against worries. And then he tells us later about, think on these things, whichever things are good and lovely. Any good report, any virtue, think on these things in the peace of God. Again, keeping your heart. So he's telling us to think on the good things, but he's also empowering us to do so. And if our mind starts wandering off, what do we do? We say, Lord... Thank you for the words of life. Thank you, Lord. Remember in the scripture, Jesus called the devil Beelzebub. And what is Beelzebub? Lord of the flies. And I always think about carnal thoughts. Thoughts. Dead thoughts. Carnal thoughts, I think, dead thoughts. And what feeds on dead things? Flies. So if you want a lot of fly problems... Let it have a lot of carnal thoughts. 
Beelzebub will be right there. Jesus said, my words, my thoughts, book of Isaiah, are not your thoughts. God is trying to bring you in through his word so that what? You have spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And guess what? This is an ongoing, growing, learning, casting down imaginations, knowing that when the mind runs wild and inflamed, you begin to say, Father, thank you for bringing my heart, my mind back to where it needs to be. You exercise yourself unto godliness. It says, physical exercise profits little, but godliness profits greatly. Amen? And that's all part of the package where you're exercising yourself. Paul said, even void of offense toward God and man. Doing your best to make sure that your heart is right before God and man. And if it's not right, you're saying, Father, thank you for cleansing my heart. Thank you for loosening, loosening me from those, those powers, Father. And those thoughts as I think upon the, the good things. It's a real exercise, everyone. It's a real exercise in yourself. You see, you are saying, see, in Romans 1, it said that when man fell, he turned away from God. And he was unthankful, and his foolish heart was darkened. <coughs> Thank God when we come back to Jesus, when we come to Him and we're born again, we're giving glory unto God and we're learning truth. It's, it's, in the fall, they believed the lie. Now we're receiving the truth. And those in Adam and those are in Christ. One is born again, one is not. One is living for God, one is not. And out of that, we're learning how to live. And the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And He's trying to teach us and train us how to live for the glory of God. We're resting in God. We're having confidence. As we looked at Timothy and Titus, before the world began, God had a plan and a purpose for our lives. Amen. And out of that, we're saying to God, now this is, this is the absolute key, everyone. And that's what covenant was made for. And that's why Hebrews 6 is talking about God's blood covenant, everlasting covenant, that God has a purpose and a plan. And it's to bless you. That's his heart. That's who he is, the Father. He wants to bless your life. That's why Hebrews 6, I'll, I'll turn to this. And he says it's so clear, and this is for you. You, you want to know probably the one problem that we have as humans is we have the hardest time trusting God. <laughs> That's what the fall did to us. The fall got us to the point where we wouldn't trust God, but we trust in ourselves and we trust in the lie. Everything. Jesus said, I came for the purpose I came was to reveal the truth. That's why he came, to undo the lies in our life so that we could know the truth, and the truth that we know would set us free. And as we knew the truth that set us free, we could live and move and have our being and life in Christ. Jesus said, all those that are of the truth, hear my voice. So he's trying to, what he does, look at this. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, He sent Jesus. Why? Because He loved. Amen? He sent His only Son for us to die to show us that we can trust God, that we can believe God, that we can open our hearts to God, our whole heart to God. God sees it all anyway. But he said, make your request known. Sometimes we might say, well, he knows it. Uh-uh, that's not the way it works. Jesus, Jesus even said, the Father knows that you need these things. But he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. See, he knows, but he also says, you seek. He knows. Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a good end. But you know what it says right after that? He says, I'll be sought of you earnestly for that plan. Amen? <laughs> hey, if you want God's best, guess what? you got to want God's best. <laughs> Amen? It's very simple. God's got his best for you, but you've got to want it. 
And what I'm trying to help you to see is how to live in God's best so that you can allow the, let the Holy Spirit help you and lead you and guide you because guess what? He's the only one who knows the way. The Holy Spirit's got the monopoly on the truth. He's the only one who knows the way into the Father's plan for your life. And that's why, guess what the Holy Spirit says? I will help you. Seed of Abraham, Isaiah 41, Galatians 3.29, Hebrews chapter 2. Seed of Abraham, my friend. Hallelujah. Abraham was called what? A friend of God. Abraham, God worked in his heart mightily from the call, brought him through so many things. He didn't always do things right, but his faith was accounted to him as righteous. He kept pressing on. He kept looking to God. And as he did, God fulfilled the purposes and plans for Abraham's life, even though he wasn't perfect. David wasn't perfect. God fulfilled the plan in these men's lives and the women of the Bible. Why? Because they trusted. They trusted in covenant. Abraham, Isaac had to trust God, his son. Think about Isaac on the altar. And his son, his father, Abraham's ready to slay him with a knife. Because God said, offer your son. But then God said, Abraham, Abraham, don't slay your son. I see your heart. You are willing. But guess what? God sent his only son. Amen? So we've got to see here, everybody. Can you imagine Isaac, what he went through? At probably 15 years old. And he sees his father. And he's submitting to everything that his father, what's going on? Can you imagine the heart and the faith of Isaac to believe in his father and what was happening? Can you imagine later on we see in the book of Genesis it says the fear of Isaac. The fear of Isaac, the awesomeness, who God is. Definitely Isaac learned in faith. The next generation was coming up. And then Jacob, he had to learn. His name was changed from Jacob to what? Israel. He had to learn and he had to grow. He had to learn at Bethel. He had to learn the God of Bethel, the house of God, the God of the house, El Bethel. He had to learn who God was. And as he learned who God was, he saw it just wasn't the house, it was the God of the house. He said, this is none other than the gate of heaven, the house of God. He saw the angels ascending and descending. Jesus said, also you shall see, as he said to Philip, you shall see the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Folks, the faith of these men. It says in Hebrews, it says, look to these men who by faith have walked with God. It says, follow their faith. Why? Because they are following God. And as they follow God, follow them as they follow God. Imitate their faith. Meaning, because they're looking to God. Learn from them. Learn from their mistakes. Learn from the things. Because what? Jesus blazed a trail for us. And now there's others that are following as that trail. Amen? So in Hebrews 6, a couple more verses here and we'll close. It says, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. There was nobody. God was, there's no one else hired. So what? God swore by himself. What did he say? Blessing I will bless, multiplying I will multiply. Seed of Abraham, my friend. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. 25 years for Isaac to be born. And he continued on to the offering up of Isaac. It was like, I guess, another 15 years. God, see, what I'm trying to show you, everybody, is God's working in our lives are long-term. Long-term. Trust. Walk. Obedience. Listen. Work out. Yielding to God. This is your life. This is your journey. Before time began, the grace empowering you. Helping other people to come in and hear of God's love and letting them hear the path that is available for them that God has. There is 
not a lot that really know how to be led by the Spirit into the path of righteousness that God has for their lives. God, I believe in these end times, is wanting to absolutely bring truth to your hearts in such a way that you will see it. You will know it. You'll live in it. You'll walk in it. You will know this is the path walking in it. You'll know when you're getting off the path. You'll know when things start happening. The Holy Spirit, Paul said that if you're any other wise mind, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. So the Holy Spirit, he'll reveal things and show things to you when you're getting off the path. Words, things like, boy, you haven't been in church in a while. You haven't been fellowshipping with your brothers and sisters in a while. You haven't been reading your Bible. You haven't. You know, what is he trying to do? He's trying to encourage you, say, that was the path. You're getting further from where I can lead and guide you. And all I can do now is help get you out of the path. Amen? So you can run your race. So he keeps nudging you. Get back. Get back where I can help lead you and guide you. Get into the Word so I can lead you. Get those prayers going so I can answer them. Get yourself in the house of God and fellowship in the Father's house. All right, last few verses here. For men barely swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is an end to all strife. Just basically saying men in the natural make covenants. And he says, wherein God, willing more abundantly show the heirs of promise, the unchangeableness of his counsel, confirmed by an oath. That means you are the heirs of promise. And God hasn't changed his mind. What does he want to do? He wants to bless you. <laughs> Seed of Abraham. Amen? Blessing I will bless. Multiplying I will multiply. That's what he wants to do in your life. He wants to bless you so you can multiply. As a new creation, you can bear fruit Bring people to Jesus. Teach them about Jesus so that they also can be on that path of life. Amen? Be fruitful and what? Multiply. See these seats? There's a few that need to be filled here. Guess what? Be fruitful and what? Multiply. See what God wants, to, wants us to see. Knowing there's a vision. And as we do and we all press into it, God begins to work vitally in our hearts and minds. That by two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we may have strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope what? Set before us. So God has a hope that he has set before us and guess what? God cannot what? Lie. He cannot lie. He's given you the truth in the word. We have confidence in it. And so what are we doing? We're bringing our petitions, our requests. We're making them known unto God. And in it, we're saying, I don't know everything, God. I'm making my request to you. You know the end from the beginning. You are what? The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and what? The end. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you for your promises. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the good things that you have brought into our life today. We thank you that you're the Alpha and the Omega. You're the beginning and the end. And Father, you hold us in the palm of your hand. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word that has gone forth in the hearts. That it will not return void. It will prosper where unto it's set. Father, I thank you for the fruitfulness that is coming up in each one of their lives. And now, Father, I pray that there's a greater faith in the love that you are truly there with ears to hear. That, Lord, you really want to hear as we make our petitions to you. You really want us to make known our requests. You really want them out of our heart and mouth that you hear them. And if we believe you hear them, then we know that we have the petitions that we desire of you. So I pray today, Father, that no one will leave here the same. That they will know there's a plan and a purpose. They will know there's destiny. And they will know, Father, that you are there to fulfill that destiny in their life. That you are a helper. 
you help the seed of Abraham, my friend. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right. Go with God. God loves you. Thank you, Lord Jesus.